We're going to continue this sermon series. It's a periodical sermon series in actuality where we're talking about a variety of different roles and responsibilities that exist within the Lord's church. We've talked about the roles and responsibilities of church members to elders, the roles and responsibilities of elders to church members in this series that we're calling The Blueprint. Well, this morning what I want to do is talk about the spiritual disposition of of deacons like Kevin read for us in our scripture reading this morning and did such an excellent job. We're going to focus on the spiritual aspect of being a deacon in the Lord's church. I didn't come to speak about our deacons, but hopefully this will be greatly encouraging and inspiring to those who serve as deacons in our congregation here at Paintsville. If I were to say the word deacon to you, what word would you provide to me as a synonym? Can you imagine what the work of an elder would look like if you didn't have deacons? Well, you would just have elders that are bogged down with all kinds of responsibilities and are not able to adequately fulfill the responsibilities given to them by God. Can you imagine what the work of a minister or a preacher would look like if you did not have faithful deacons who carried out their work? Well, it would certainly be a whole lot more difficult than it already is. You see, a delegation of responsibilities among God's people is something that you find patterned all the way back to the Old Testament and you find it patterned within the New Testament as well. If you were to go to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 20 and to verse 26, He really gives us what we could call the definition of the word deacon. He gives us His definition. He says, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. The word servant that is used by Jesus in this particular verse is diakonos in the original Greek. It's actually the word from which we derive servant, minister, and the word deacon. You see, I think in the past we've done a really good job about teaching our young men that one day they should aspire to grow up, fulfill the qualifications that you find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and serve as elders in the Lord's church, shepherds of God's flock. I think it should be the case in every congregation that you should have an elder, an elder who's done it for a long time, sit the young men in a congregation down and teach them those qualifications you find in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Because let's be honest, those aren't just qualifications for the, the office of an elder in the Lord's church. Those are just good goals to aspire to when you're talking about being a, a New Testament Christian. Those are things that we should, we should try to attain and achieve. But perhaps we've not done a very good job about teaching our young men that they should grow up and live such a life that one day they could serve as deacons in the Lord's church. And so I want to fix that this morning. It would be a good thing, a good thing, if you grew up to be the kind of man that the church could appoint as a deacon one day. And it would not simply be because you meet certain physical qualifications, you've got strong arms and you've got a strong back and you're willing to do things that perhaps other people aren't willing to do. That That's not what it's about. It's because you would also fulfill spiritual qualifications set forth for us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we could could see you as a person who would serve the Lord faithfully and serve this congregation faithfully as well. So in our lesson this morning, really what I want to do is three things. We're going to do three groupings of four. First, I want to provide you with four fundamental instructions concerning the role of deacons in the Lord's church. Secondly... I want to talk about four fundamental qualifications concerning the office of a deacon in the Lord's church. And thirdly, we'll conclude by looking at four fundamental revelations as it concerns the the work of deacons in the Lord's church. So let's just go ahead and begin with, with number one. Four fundamental instructions concerning the role of deacons. I want to give you four things that I believe that we've done a really good job of in the Lord's church teaching, not only to the younger generation, but also to the older generation. Four fundamental teachings that I think we've we've really gotten across over the years. And the first is this. We've taught the generic and the official sense of the word deacon in the Bible. Now, the word deacon can be just a reference to servant or minister. When you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the King James Version of the Bible, it uses this word, office of a deacon. Now, you're not going to find the word office in any other modern translation, including the translation that I hold in my hands, the New King James Version. It's not found in the original Greek, so why would it be the case that those who translated the King James Version would insert that word office into the qualifications of deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3? I do not believe that it's inherently bad, but I think it's the reason 
they wanted to make a distinction between the office of a deacon and a servant in the Lord's church. You see, while all Christians are servants, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Philippians chapter 1 teaches us that in the New Testament church there was a patterned special servant that we would call a deacon whose qualifications are set forth in 1 Timothy chapter 3 for what this man must meet in order to be appointed by a congregation. Every Christian is a servant, yes. But not every Christian qualifies to be a deacon in the Lord's church. Now the NIV tried to play a little trick on us. See, the NIV went to Romans chapter 16 and verse 1 when it was talking about our sister Phoebe, and it said, first, yeah, Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in, in Centuria. Well, what's the problem with calling Phoebe a deacon? Well, those who are trying to go beyond the bounds of, of Scripture and the pattern that we find within the New Testament would like to see the Lord's church become a little bit more gender neutral, where we can appoint women in certain positions within the Lord's church. But the truth of the matter is, you can't do that. You know why? Because when you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and Paul sets forth these qualifications for deacons in the Lord's church, what's the first one? The husband of one wife. A woman can't be the husband of one wife. Phoebe didn't serve in the office of a deacon. Now she sure, being a servant of the Lord, was a faithful servant who was even commended by the Apostle Paul and is recorded for all of generations for us to remember her servitude and her faithfulness. But she didn't qualify to be the one who held the office of a deacon like what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Secondly, I think we've done a really good job in the Lord's church about making sure that we understand a deacon must be married, the husband of, of one wife. Phoebe wasn't the husband of one wife. She couldn't be in the office of a deacon. Thirdly, I think we've done a really good job also teaching that a deacon is selected in a certain way. So the second big problem that arises within the Lord's church in the New Testament is found in Acts chapter 6. The first would be, Acts chapter 5 and Ananias and Sapphira. And you remember what happened to that husband and wife. But in Acts chapter 6, there's a problem that arises in the first century church in Jerusalem. You see, there are Hellenistic widows and there's Hebrew widows. You go back to Acts chapter 2 and you'll remember that there were many countries that were represented on the day of Pentecost. Among those, 3,000 that obeyed the gospel. It's quite possible they brought their families with them. And so here we have some members of the Lord's church in Acts chapter 2 that are Hellenistic widows. And the church is taking care of the widows. I love that. I love that. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God is this. Take care of your widows. I love that the church in Jerusalem was taking care of their widows. But then a problem arises among the widows. You see, in the daily distribution, the Hellenistic widows aren't getting what the Hebrew widows are getting. And there might be a lot of different factors at play here. It could be some racial undertones as the Hebrews were kind of standoffish when it came to the Hellenistics. But whatever it be the case, we see that they're being neglected. And so the members of the church, they bring this problem to the apostles. And what do the apostles say? They say, well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to appoint seven men from among yourselves who are full of the Holy Spirit, of good reputation, and wise. So the problem in the Lord's church was a physical problem. There were some widows who were being neglected in the daily distribution. But when the apostles said, this is what you're going to do, I want you to appoint seven men, what did they attach to those seven men? Well, they didn't attach just physical qualifications. They attached spiritual qualifications. They said, we want you to, a man to be full of the Holy Spirit, good reputation, and wise. Now, some people go to Acts chapter 6 and they believe that this might be the first deacons in the Lord's church who served under the apostles who would have been their overseers, whatever it be the case. I know that you find the word deacon in Acts chapter 6. In fact, when your Bibles, when you go to Acts chapter 6 and verse 2, the apostles say, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The word serve tables in verse 2 is diakonos the word from which we derive deacon in the New Testament. 
It wasn't that the apostles didn't like the widows or that they didn't want to take care of the widows. The problem was this. The apostles said, we can't minister the Word of God the way that we need to if we also have to take care of these other responsibilities. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to appoint seven men to take care of those physical responsibilities. See, elders in the Lord's church shouldn't have to do the work of a deacon. Deacons in the Lord's church shouldn't have to do the work of an elder. There shouldn't be a mix-up. Deacons should take care of the physical responsibilities that have been assigned to them by the eldership so that the eldership can take care of the spiritual responsibilities that have been assigned to them by God. Which leads me to number four. I think we've done a good job of teaching that the role of deacons is physical in nature. Now there's a sentiment that says elders take care of the spiritual needs while deacons take care of the physical needs. And there is a sentiment of truth in that statement. You think about Acts chapter 6. The problem that arises in the first century church was physical. Some widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so the apostles say, we can't do both, so you're going to choose seven men from among yourself. They delegated responsibilities in the church. A lack of delegation to the church is going to result in regression of growth individually and collectively when it pertains to our spirituality. These men didn't just have strong backs and strong arms. They had to meet spiritual qualifications. You see, I believe it to be the case that oftentimes in the Lord's church what we focus on when we're talking about deacons is just the physical. It's the wrong approach. If you appoint men who can do the physical but are not spiritual in nature, what are you going to have? Well, you're going to have men who who don't fulfill the responsibilities that they're given. But if you have men who are spiritual in nature first, and you give them responsibilities, if they're faithful in little, they'll be faithful in much. Isn't that what Jesus said? And so they'll carry out those responsibilities given to them. And here's my emphasis for this sermon. This is truth. There is a spiritual side of a deacon. Men aren't just appointed to a deaconship because they have the physical but lack the spiritual. They are appointed to a deaconship because they had the spiritual and they can fulfill the physical needs, the tasks that have been given to them by the church. So let's move on to our second grouping of four. Four spiritual qualifications concerning deacons. Brother Franklin Camp was a faithful gospel preacher in, in times past. He's passed on now onto his eternal reward. I love to listen to him preach. I've got a couple of his books. And I want you to listen to what he said about the role of a deacon in the church. He says, The hands of the compassionate heart of the church, as it extends itself in rendering deeds of mercy and goodwill, as opportunities are presented, a minister of service to someone who has a need. The deacons of the Lord's church are an arm of the church that keep their eyes and their hearts open to the needs of the people that are around them. And they carry out or execute the tasks that have been assigned to them by the elders. They make sure the needs are met. And if they cannot meet the needs themselves, they're going to go to the eldership and say, we've got this need, I cannot meet it, but maybe there's someone else that can meet it. Either way, they're going to make sure the needs in the church are met and the people are taken care of. I believe this personally, that the number one church member who should be ringing off the phones of the elders with opportunities to serve should be a deacon. They're aware of the congregation. They're aware of the needs going on around them. They're seeking to find ways to serve those needs and involve the congregation in many ways in serving those needs. So you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and what you find are 17 qualifications for elders You find nine qualifications for deacons. And then the deacons' wives also must meet qualifications, and you find four of those qualifications. Now, when you go to Titus chapter 1, there's also 17 qualifications concerning an eldership. Nine qualifications concerning deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3. For just a moment, I want to show you four qualifications that I believe teach us important lessons about the spiritual side of a deacon in the Lord's church. Here's the first one. It's found in verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent. And the word reverent, it means honest, it means integrity, 
it means honorable. In fact, it's the same words you find in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 when Paul is talking about the things that we ought to meditate upon. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble. A deacon is a noble man. Well, what does that mean? Well, every deacon is assigned a task by an eldership, by a group of shepherds to carry out of the congregation while they look for the needs of individual members. And sometimes that deacon is going to go to the elders and he's going to request certain needs that he needs in order to be able to carry out the duties that have been assigned to him. To be a noble man is to be faithful in the things that have been assigned to you. He's reverent. He recognizes that this role and responsibility that I'm carrying out in the Lord's church, it's of great importance. There is no greater thing that I could do than to be a servant and to serve is what I've been assigned to do. Secondly, you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. Paul says, not double-tongued. And we don't really talk like that anymore. So what does that word or phrase, not double-tongued, mean? Imagine that you have a woman who goes up to another woman after services and she says, Oh, that's such a beautiful dress. I love that dress. And you look beautiful in it. And then after they part ways, she goes over to one of her friends and she says, can you believe she wore that dress today? I mean, she looks awful. That's double-tongued. What about a car salesman who's desperately trying to sell a car? And that car salesman tells the potential customer, because he wants to get the car off the lot, you know what, I drive that car all the way to California and I trust it. And then he goes into his general manager. He says, I wouldn't even drive that car to the grocery store because I'm afraid the transmission would go out. That's double-tongued. A deacon in the Lord's church isn't going to cause issues when it comes to his words or his attitude toward others. He's not a hypocrite in speech or action. He's going to profess and live what he professes. He's going to do the things that have been assigned to him by the eldership to carry out the needs of the congregation because he recognizes the great importance of the role that has been given to him in taking care of the family of God. Here's another one. He holds the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. You know, oftentimes in the New Testament, the church is referred to as a mystery. You find that in Ephesians chapter 3. Because all throughout the generations of time and the millenniums before Jesus came to this earth, what you find are the prophets looking around the corner trying to find what God was going to do in His grand scheme of redemption to make sure that souls were saved. And so in essence, it was kind of a mystery. But then that mystery was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And then the mystery is talked about in past tense... It's being the church. Here's a man who holds the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. We're talking about the spiritual side of a deacon. And I love that phrase. It's a judgment that must be made when you're appointing deacons at a congregation. But the truth of the matter is, is that he holds the truth, the truth that shall make men free, John 8 verse 32, with a pure conscience. He's not swayed by false doctrine. He's the real thing. He loves the Lord's church. He loves God's people. And that is never questioned. And you know that this man meeting these spiritual qualifications that have been set forth by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he is going to carry out these physical duties that have been assigned to him in a very spiritual way that's going to make a profound difference in the lives of the members of a congregation. But here's one more. Likewise... Their wives. Isn't it interesting that when you're talking about deacons and the qualifications given by the Holy Spirit, he set forth qualifications for the wife of a deacon. See, the wife of a deacon is a sincerely faithful Christian. He's blessed with a wife who lives faithfully. This is oftentimes the case, especially when you look at the qualifications for elders in the first part of this chapter. What you find is the Holy Spirit oftentimes sets forth qualifications for men as it pertains to their homes. I believe that's important because, you see, sometimes you learn more about a man by looking at his family and his children than you do by knowing who you know in a church building. 
So God says, if you want to know this person, look at his family. It's not to say that everything that goes wrong in his family can be instantly linked back to the father. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying, look at his children. And when you look at his children, what do you see? When you look at his home, what do you see? Is he faithful? Does he have his children in submission? And then the question is asked as it pertains to elders, how can he rule in the church of God if he cannot even rule in his own home? And when you look at these qualities and qualifications when it pertains to the wife of a deacon in 1 Timothy chapter 3, what you see is a huge statement. She must be reverent, same word, noble, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. He doesn't say she has to be perfect. No person can be perfect. What he's saying is she must be faithful. All people can be faithful. So those are four qualifications as it concerns a deacon. But here's the last grouping of four that I want to give to you this morning. Four fundamental revelations concerning deacons in the Lord's church. Here's four verses that I believe we need to take great note of as it involves the work of a deacon in the Lord's church. Let's just walk down through these. Here's the first one. 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 16. So Paul's writing to, to Timothy, and he says, The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onithrasus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. The word minister is diakonos, the original Greek from which we derive minister, servant, or deacon. Paul's in prison. How do you suppose a man could serve Paul in prison? What's that look like? What kind of needs does Paul have in prison? What kind of man does it take to serve another man in chains and esteem that man in chains higher than he esteems himself? That's what it means to serve. What's that look like? Well... I got one word for you. Deacon. What about this one? Philemon 1, verse 12. Verse 12, it's a one chapter book of the Bible. We talked about this this morning. Roger did an excellent job, and I find this verse fascinating. He says, Whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. The word minister, once again, in the original Greek. Now Paul's sending a letter back to Philemon by the hands of Onesimus. And what is Paul saying? Paul says, I could really use Onesimus to minister me in my chains. So here, once again, Paul's in chains. Here's a person who is a slave who has been ministering to Paul. What's it look like when you esteem a person in chains greater than yourself? Enough so to minister to them, to serve them. What's that involve? i got a word for it. Deacon. See, deacons in the Lord's church are the servant of servants. They're the lowly of lows. They're the least of all to be the greatest of all in the kingdom. They're willing to do the things that other people, I, don't, I just really don't want to do that. I mean, that just seems really time-consuming. Or, you know, that's not really my vein of service in the church, and, and I just, I'm not really interested in serving people that way. I just don't think I would be comfortable. What about this one? Matthew chapter 25. Now, you remember in the scene that Jesus provides in Matthew 25, we're looking at Judgment Day, and Jesus commends all of these people who fed him when he was hungry, who gave him clothing when he was naked, who visited him in prison, so on and so forth. But then he transitions, and he provides a contrast, and he talks about those who saw him in those situations, yet failed to serve him. And Jesus says in verse 44, then they will also answer him. Remember, they're fighting back and forth with Jesus. Wait a second, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you a stranger or sick or naked or in prison? When did we see you in those situations? Jesus says, and did not minister to you. The word minister in the original is diakonos. 
It's a judgment day scene. This is what we're about in the church. Deacons play an important role as the eyes, ears, and the heart of the church. They know they are servants like the rest of us and they're willing to serve. Sometimes, most of the time, you're not going to know what they're doing because they're doing it behind the scenes and they're doing things that benefit the people of God. Question, if every Christian is to be a servant, how much more should a man who was qualified by those qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 not also be faithful in his work as a deacon? This one, to me, is very sobering. And oftentimes, I'll apply preaching to this one. The very end of the qualifications given to deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I believe, and I don't want to rank them, which one's most important, which one's least important. I don't want to do that, but I want to say that this is of great importance. I believe there's a reason it's at the end of the qualifications. Paul says, for those who served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing, great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I don't know what the degrees of reward look like in in heaven. I know that there must be some because oftentimes throughout the New Testament there is discussion of such. Perhaps this has to do with with the degree of reward as it pertains to deacons who serve well and who, who do the things that God's asked them to do. But what is the opposite of a deacon who serves well and obtains a great standing and boldness? in the eyes of God. Well, that would be a deacon who didn't serve well. What's that look like? It could be a deacon who didn't carry out the task given to him by the elders, who wasn't aware of the needs around him, didn't really concern himself with the people of God and what they were going through, didn't try to faithfully carry out the tasks and execute the service that needed for each situation in in the Lord's church. There's a great joy to be found in serving others. So what's the disposition of deacons? Well, it's certainly a physical task. I know that they're given the physical responsibilities of the church, but let's never overlook this. The spiritual qualifications given to those who desire the office to become a servant of the Lord. Thank God for servants in the church who take care of the needs of others. Perhaps we've got someone in our midst this morning who's not a New Testament Christian, has never obeyed the gospel, yet to put on Christ in baptism. I plead with you to let today be your day of salvation. You must hear the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. The Word is about Jesus from cover to cover. It's about His great love for you. And you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, verse 24. You must be willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. It's a 180 change in your life from sinfulness toward faithfulness to God. You must be willing to confess His name before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, to be immersed for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Live a faithful life. I don't know about you, But one day I want to live my life in such a way that when I finally come face to face with my Lord, that He will call me His servant. And He will metaphorically, figuratively place a crown on my head.